might be asking, who are Seventh-day Adventists? Commonly known as Adventists, we are a Christian movement established in 1863. We have 28 fundamental beliefs and more than 20 million members. We also observe the Seventh-day Sabbath. Worldwide, we have more than 162,000 congregations. We serve countless communities with our education institutions, with two million students. And 198 hospitals around the world. And it's all because we love Jesus. Situated in Somerset West near Cape Town, the mother city of South Africa, Helderberg College is an institute of the Southern Africa Union under the Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division of the World Seventh-day Adventist Church. Its main objective is to offer quality Christian education to men and women who will become the leaders of tomorrow. The history of Seventh-day Adventist education in South Africa began with the establishment of Claremont Union College, Cape Town, in 1893. The college changed locations in 1919 and again in 1928 in an attempt to follow more closely the philosophy that has motivated this institution. After the first move, the college became known as Spionkop College and the last move established Hildeberg College on the slopes of Hildeberg Mountain just outside Somerset West, South Africa. Therefore, Hildeberg College today is the fruit of seeds sown by the pioneers, both staff and students, at the two earlier locations. Presently, Helderberg College, with an enrollment of about 300 students per year, the strength of the college lies in the dedication of its faculty and staff to Adventist education. This institution has been producing not only professionals for the corporate world, for the government, but spiritual leaders as well. And I just need to mention that we have an excellent media department. We have produced God-fearing Adventists, young people who have gone out into the world and have made their mark in the field of media, both in government and in the world and in the church. And I've enjoyed myself thoroughly. I'm proud to be a staff member here. Um, I've seen the place grow over these years. I'm a lecturer in the Faculty of Business and currently also as the Dean of the Faculty. I teach the accounting courses and also marketing and we continue to pride ourselves in producing the best students that this world can accommodate. Helderberg College is a very special college. It's not just the university um, like the normal university you get or the college. It's a place where we prepare our students for life.
our opening text for this devotion is going to be found from the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 3. And we read it from the King James Version. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Our loving Father, we come before your presence and we ask that as much as we have gone through this passage, you may now make your passage in our lives and through our lives for your own glory. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Still embracing the committing theme, we are nearing home. We will be delivering it under a subheading, the prodigal prophet. And I'm going to read the text one more time. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. We have a movement that has been saturating the church from corner to corner. And this movement has been preaching the gospel of fleeing the cities to go to the rural areas. But we are also standing here to affirm that the voice of the prophet should not die in the cities because our cities, especially in South, in South Africa, they are a host and a home to 66.7% of the population. So they are so big that they cannot be ignored. And Jonah was one such prophet to the cities. The book ascribed to the authorship of Jonah the prophet is unique amongst its Old Testament prophets, writers, or writings and peers. The book of Jonah is the only book that, though classified amongst the prophets, addresses itself to the prophet and not to his prophecy, to the messenger and not to his message to the men and not to the people of Nineveh. The narrative of the people of Nineveh and its population density simply forms the context within which Jonah assumes his identity as a subject that God seeks to deal with. God never calls a man without a targeted population or audience for whom the call is meant. Everyone's call is unique to meet the demands for which the call is commissioned. The called subject is always subjected to the object for which the call has been initiated. God first assesses the grace needs of a person, of a collective, of a group or a population subject and then goes to look for a messenger to meet the same needs. The target population of the grace needs does not exist to affirm or to validate the prophet, but the prophet exists and is sent to validate and authenticate the grace needs of the target population or the collective. The call equation shall always be no target population, no prophet, and not no prophet, no target population, or collective subjects. Put differently, it is the prophet that exists to validate the grace needs of the target population or the collective subjects and not the targeted population or collective subject that exists to validate or authenticate the call of the prophet. It is not out of the regard 
for the prophet that the prophet is called into the office of a prophet. But to the contrary, it is out of God's regard for the targeted peoples that the prophet is called. Never think that God's call over you is an expression or affirmation of his love for you, but it is his love for them whom the call is meant that you are called. The Bible unequivocally declares that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to eat. It was not his love for his son that he sent the world, that he sent him to the world or gave the world to him. When God loves the targeted community, a collective or a population subject, he gives them a prophet, a messenger, a preacher or a shepherd who equals his love for them. It was the world that God loved and not Christ. The world is not God's token of love for Christ, but Christ is God's token of love for the world. It is Nineveh, not Jonah, that he loved. His love is not about you, but it is about his people. On the other hand, God's call, choice and gift of a prophet, messenger or a preacher to a targeted population is his expression of faith and not love on the called. In calling and sending the called on his errands to the peoples that he has loved, God expresses his faith in the messenger, prophet or preacher, that they will accomplish the mission for which they are called and sent. In a way, God has more faith in the messenger than the messenger has and will ever have faith in him. God's faith in us is an initiating faith while ours is a responsive faith to his. He is the sole author and finisher of faith and our faith in his faith over us remains a responsive faith to his. When God has faith in a person, he assigns a person on an errand to his prescribed audience or targeted population. And after God had received the report about the violence of Nineveh, he then looked for a messenger to send to this great city. The demographics of the city of Nineveh and the social ills that defined that city are still the same and present even in our present times. It was Jonah upon whom God had pinned a faith that matched the grace needs of Nineveh. God's faith on whom he calls to send is always without an alternative. He never calls a man or a woman without a specific target population or audience that can only be exclusively reached by the same and none other. Over and over, the Lord had declared that he will require the blood of those to whom the messenger had been sent on the messenger himself should the sent messenger default on the execution of his assignment like Jonah had intended to. By his call on a person to send, he also affirms that the task for which the called had been assigned to execute cannot be done by any other but by the one on whom the call has rested. None is called as a second option, nor is one called with an option of an alternative candidate in the event of defaulting. You either go or he requires the blood of those to whom you had been sent in the event of your decline 
of the same. We therefore do not talk in terms of probabilities when we affirm that there is an audience or a targeted population that can never be reached or serviced except through you. A classic example is that of Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed because Lot had defaulted on his duties as his prophet to the cities. For his failed responsibilities, God had not provided an alternative by whom the cities would be saved. When we could, then we could understand why he contended with Moses' reluctance to go lead the slave nation from the bondage until he prevailed against him because there was no alternative to a Moses. We can also in the same light appreciate his stubborn determination to take the prodigal Jonah to that great city of Nineveh and his provision of an unconventional submarine to take him to his assignment because there was no second Jonah. But Jonah fled away from the presence of God. In a way, Jonah had apostatized. God had to work on the conversion of Jonah first because the conversion of more than 120,000 male residents discounting women and children, as the Bible says, of Nineveh depended on the conversion of this one man. The notion that the conversion of others and the many is directly tied to our own individual conversion, it's very scary. The unstated truth is that there are many people who will never be saved unless the messenger is saved. Many will never be converted unless the messenger self is converted. The truth is that the conversion of the multitude out there is intricately tied to the conversion of the prophet, messenger, and the preacher. The question is, especially in these latter days, how many people's conversion depend on your conversion? Jesus talking to his disciples about the prophet, about the Pharisees, he said, please, these are the people whose voice you should listen to, but whose example you should never emulate. But our calling is different. How many families' salvation depends on your faith in your own family? The question is how much faithfulness among the faithful depends on your faithfulness? There was no alternative to Moses, and there was no second option to Jonah, and there was no second lot. There is no alternative to you. There is a prodigal multitude that will never come home until the prodigal prophet, the prodigal messenger, the prodigal preacher has come home. 